Uh, good morning. Early good morning in New York and even earlier going west. Uh, good afternoon in Europe uh, and Africa and good evening in Korea and Asia. And uh, hello to all of you around the world. I'm Dr. Yael Danieli founder and director of the International Center for the Study, Prevention, and Treatment of Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma, ICMJLT for short. Today, the ICMJLT is joining with Parliamentarians for Global Action, PGA for short, <laughs> to observe this year's International Day of Peace. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could say celebrate the International Day of Peace or to wish you all a happy International Day of Peace? By the way, I wrote, I wrote this last night before I heard Putin's speech. But humanity is forcing us once again to have to envision a just peace that is a peace that will affirm the rights of victims of the crime of aggression. And today, and we, those of us who are involved in promoting the criminalizing aggression know that aggression often indeed is the context for all other atrocity crimes. Because if we don't uh, seek just peace, individuals, families, societies, nations, and the international community will continue to live with the pain and terror of open unhealed wounds that will fester lifelong not only in the directly affected generations, but in generations to come. From a perspective of a psychologist, a trauma specialist, and a victimologist, who has dedicated much effort to articulating reparative justice, rights of victims of any atrocity crime, be it genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, or the crime of aggression, which is our focus today. These rights have been cumulatively enshrined since 1985, most progressively by the International Criminal Court. As the title of today's webinar implies, they must be affirmed and fulfilled for a genuine just peace to be realized. Today, a first of a series, we will hear about and by some victims of and experts on the crime of aggression. Each will speak for about eight minutes. This will be followed by a brief discussion among them, after which we will open the floor to a dialogue with the audience. After last words by the presenters, the co-moderators will conclude the webinar. Again, before I introduce our first presenter, I want to share with you the urgency of our work. Uh, President Putin made sure of that, to give a speech like he did on the International Day of Peace. Our first presenter is Dr. Ethan Hisiok Shin. Ethan is a lecturer at the Catholic University of Korea, at the Republic of Korea. He is a researcher at the Institute of Legal Studies, Yonsei University, 
an illegal analyst at Transitional Justice Working Group, which is a Seoul-based human rights NGO. Ethan, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Danielli and uh, Parliamentarians for Global Action uh, for organizing today's event. I will be making a presentation today about uh, Japan's past aggression, uh, crimes against peace, and how it has uh, affected the, uh, how it has, res has resulted in other atrocity crimes, as uh, Dr. Danielle just mentioned, including the, in particular, the sexual crimes during World War II. Uh, so just to give a good uh, short uh, overcap of the events, uh, Japan, uh, as you know, first invaded Manchuria in 1931 and uh, continued to wage uh, uh, the Pacific War until 1945. And uh, this is uh, findings from the, the Tokyo Tribunal, uh, also known as the International Military Tribunal for the Far East in 1948, which found uh, Japan, uh, the Japanese military and civilian leaders guilty of the crimes against humanity, uh, crimes against peace, uh, committed as a conspiracy and also individually against China, uh, the US and other uh, allied uh, states. Uh, and one, uh, and this, these, uh, ju the, the judgment of not only the, the Tokyo Tribunal but other allied war crimes tribunal uh, courts uh, were affirmed in the San Francisco Peace Treaty, which Japan also uh, is a signatory. Now, there's also there's one issue that was not addressed in the Tokyo Tribunal, and uh, that is the uh, Japan's earlier annexation of Korea uh, in 1910. Uh, this, this set of affairs actually started somewhat in 1904 during the uh, <coughs> Russo-Japanese uh, War, during which Japan uh, uh, basically placed uh, South, uh, most of Korea under uh, military occupation. And uh, there were arguments at the time that uh, this uh, this Japanese action was actually a violation of the neutrality, Korean, Korean neutrality. Uh, and uh, as you know, during World War I, uh, this became an issue when Germany also violated neutral uh, Belgium and Luxembourg. Uh, also, interestingly, the treaties that were concluded after the war, which resulted in Japan's annexation of Korea, uh, were also deemed to be uh, problematic for some various uh, legal issues uh, in the uh, even at the time at contemporaries. And uh, this issue was very uh, controversial to say the least, even after uh, Japan's uh, defeat in World War II and uh, Korea's liberation afterwards. And uh, it took almost 20 years for the two countries to normalize their relations. And when they did, they actually had to leave this part uh, somewhat ambiguous, basically agree to disagree, uh, because Japan basically argued that the annexation was legal, whereas the Koreans believed that it was uh, illegal, uh, even under international law at the time. Uh, fast forward 40, 50 years, and uh, in 1985, Japan, uh, the Japanese prime minister at the time actually uh, made this admission that the colonial rule and aggression uh, were uh, uh, resulted in uh, great sufferings to the peoples uh, colonized and also occupied. However, in a more uh, recent uh, the statement by the uh, then prime minister Abe Shinzo in 2013, uh, Japan actually tried to make the claim that uh, the what happened during not not with the Korean uh, annexation, but with the uh, Japanese Japanese uh, involvement in World War II, uh, that there was no like definition of internet of uh, aggression under international law at the time. Even though, as we all know, like in 1928, there was already already the uh, Pact of Paris or the Calabrian Pact that had effectively outlawed uh, aggression, uh, war of uh, war as a state policy, and uh, which was affirmed by the Tokyo Tribunal and other uh, uh, allied tribunals. So, can we? So, is it possible to actually claim that Japan's uh, act, acts vis-a-vis uh, -vis Korea uh, were uh, illegal at the time? And uh, so there could be this kind of legal arguments, but if we look at the phenomenon of aggression itself, uh, I think it's safe to say that what Japan did uh, in 1910 uh, was problematic by modern standards. 
And uh, we can think of, the, for example, the genocide cases, uh, genocides committed by uh, the Ottomans against the Armenians and also by, also by the Nazis against the Jews during the two world wars. And all these happened before the 1948 Genocide Convention, but uh, we mo most of the people today recognize them as genocides. Uh, so, uh, so these the, this is the kind of uh, legal situation, legal and political situation with, with respect to Japan's uh, aggression. Uh, not, not so these the the Japan's um, uh, war of aggression resulted in all result also resulted in many atrocity crimes, both war crimes and uh, uh, crimes against humanity. And uh, we know there, there were medical experiments, forced labor cases. And also uh, gender-based violence, uh, most uh, notoriously the comfort women system, which today most consider as military sexual slavery. Now the comfort stations uh, were state were created all over the Japanese held territories during World War II. You can see from this map where the uh, stations were located, uh, basically all over the Japanese territories. And the nationality of the victims uh, were actually very, it, they, they came from both of the countries that Japan occupied uh, or held as colonies during the war. Yes. yes. Uh, so unfortunately, in the post-war tribunal, uh, post-war uh, war crime tri trials, the, the military sexual slavery system itself was not addressed as a crime per se, but they were actually uh, addressed in some of the Dutch war crimes trials and also during the uh, Tokyo Tribunal as a uh, war crime uh, committed by the Japanese forces. Now, the continued uh, suffering, uh, the suffering of the victims continued even after the war, after 1945. Uh, because uh, many of the victims' uh, states had this uh, very strong patriarchal norms, and this resulted in secondary victimization to the victims. And also, uh, many of the victims had uh, internalized these patriarchal norms, uh, which also uh, resulted in their sufferings. And uh, this meant that many of them had difficulty in uh, getting married uh, or having children after the war, uh, both because of physical uh, or mental trauma during the war, as well as the widespread social stigma. And uh, this means that many of the many of the, the basically the many uh, new generations that uh, could have uh, been born uh, were basically not brought out into this war in the first place. And it's also important to note that in the, in the immediate post-war years, uh, many of these victim states were dictators under the dictatorial rule, including South Korea. And this, they, many of these states also prioritized economic development over the victims' uh, redress claims. Uh, so the, the actual redress movement uh, began in earnest only in the 1990s, uh, when the victims finally started coming out and the documents related to them were revealed. And this resulted in the Japanese government's apology in 1993, uh, but many victims have deemed uh, the apology to be insufficient. And that has been backed by UN reports as well. And uh, basically, the victims are demanding uh, the seven points, which are not, which are basically the simple calls for justice and reparation that uh, one finds in the 2005 UN reparation principles. And uh, to realize these claims, uh, there has been uh, People's Tribunal, the International Women's International War Crimes Tribunal, uh, in 2000 in Tokyo. Uh, unfortunately, these movements had not been successful in. Uh, actually change bringing about the Japanese government's change and change uh, changing positions and uh, to this day the Japanese government uh, has still has yet to acknowledge uh, what happened uh, what happened with the sex crime, sex sexual slavery victims as war crimes uh, and this has meant that the victims are still struggling for justice and reparation after 30 years and in the uh, in the recent years, in uh, last year actually, uh, a South Korean court for the first time ruled that what happened during uh, what happened to the victims uh, amounted to crimes against humanity, and that they were entitled to victim uh, entitled to, to compensation. Uh, unfortunately, three months after, in a second uh, lawsuit that, that was also brought by the Comfort Women victims, uh, the court actually acknowledged Japan's sovereign immunity, and the case has currently been uh, has been uh, appealed to the High Court. Uh, because of all these legal developments, uh, one of the twelve uh, survivors in South Korea, Grandma Lee Young Soo, has actually called for a referral of the case 
uh, to the Committee Against Torture or International Court of Justice. And I, I was, I, uh, disclaimer, I'm, I have been, I've had the privilege of actually uh, working with uh, Prima Lee and other survivors in South Korea and other countries as well. And uh, the claim that the victims ha have been making is that under the convention, uh, under the torture convention, uh, Article 14 actually provides that um, the victims have, the, the victims of torture, which the Kung Fu women victims definitely uh, uh, qualify as, have the right to obtain uh, redress uh, and also uh, the right to adequate compensation uh, and also rehabilitation. So uh, given the, Jap the basically Japanese arguments, uh, J Japanese actions or inactions uh, have amounted to violations of this article. And uh, we have been making, uh, we have been trying to make the claim that uh, the South Korean government and other, other victim states should bring this case uh, before the, uh, under the uh, Convention Against Torture. So this is the actual, the, the difficult struggle that the victims have been uh, uh, waging uh, after 70 years, still 70 years after the crime, the war of aggression took place. And it kind of shows that the, and this kind of, especially gender-based violence during wartime, uh, when it is not addressed uh, properly at the time, continues to haunt uh, history and actually allows for this kind of uh, recurrence of these events, uh, notably, I guess most notably in the recent Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, on that note, I would like to, uh, Conclude my, conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ethan, for mapping for us the, both the history so comprehensively and the conceptualization of it and the tragedy that we still see today of, uh, of sexual violence in times of war. There are many activities about this, of course, across the world now. Uh, the, our center also uh, has a working group on, uh, on actually on children of rape, of those children who were created by, uh, by the rape, uh, and in their particular uh, multi-generational legacy. Uh, so thank you very much to shedding the light. Thank you very much for pointing out the length of time, the unbearable length of time of these issues of, of trying to redress. And um, let's go from, from this. Uh, and let me just add that very often here, while the perpetrator is never brought to justice, is, as Ethan described, for the women, it's really a life sentence. Uh, and in many ways for their children, if they can have children. Uh, and as Ethan mentioned, we have a lost generation as a result as well. So tragedies are compounded. Um, let me... Uh, now uh, proceed to present our second presenter, who is one of my pe favorite people in the whole wide world, uh, Ms. Kathleen Birkinshaw. Kathleen is a second generation Hibakusha, that is a daughter of a survivor of either of the atomic explosions at Hiroshima in 1945. Kathleen is an award-winning Japanese-American author of The Last Cherry Blossom, which has just been translated into Japanese and is used as a UN Office of Disarmament Affair education resource for students and teachers. Uh, our center has the honor of having uh, Kathleen as on our advisory council. Uh, dearest Kathleen, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, it is an honor to be on this panel with such esteemed speakers, and um, especially after Professor Hesek Shin's uh, emotional discussion, I'd like to focus on the uh, people that were in Japan. Um, 
being a second generation baksha, I should have known my mother was born in Hiroshima, but I didn't know until I was 11. Um, when I was 11, I realized that she had nightmares a lot, but August was the worst. And I remember that the August before, it was very similar. And so I kept asking her about it. And she finally told me that she wasn't born in Tokyo. She was actually born in Hiroshima, but she lost her family and her home and her friends to the atomic bombing. She didn't want to say any more than that because it was still too uh, difficult for her to speak about it. But then she said, don't tell anyone. I would not learn the horror that she had in those nightmares that led to her blood curdling screams in the middle of the night until I was 31 years old. And at 31, I had been hospitalized a couple times for a near fatal blood clot. And then I was diagnosed with reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is a chronic neurological progressive pain disease that affects the sympathetic nervous and the immune system. Doctors have said that my mother's exposure to the radiation and the atomic bombing uh, is related to this disease for me. Because I had such disabling pain and I knew that I wouldn't be able to walk unaided, I worried about how I could take care of my daughter who was four then, if I couldn't take care of myself very well, um, how I could help my husband um, to by working. Uh, and my mother then decided she was going to start telling me what happened on August 6th as she saw my depression growing. She told me that she had been sick over the weekend. And so on Monday the 6th, her papa said she could stay home from school that day. Uh, and then she could join her classmates the next day. Her classmates were in the center of town. They were taking down all the wooden buildings uh, after the events firebombing in Tokyo uh, in March. They had hoped that if something was used like that, they would not burn as quickly. Um, that put them at the center of town at 8.15. Her papa usually worked from home in the morning and then would travel to his newspaper office in the afternoon. But that day, he was in the city at a train station um, purchasing a train ticket for one of his employees who had an injured son in another part of Japan. So that put him in the center of town at 8.15 that day. At that time, my mother was outside chatting with her best friend Machiko. When an ear shattering popping noise and an intense burst of white light, she felt the ground shaking almost as if an earthquake. And so they just hugged each other screaming. By the end of that day, my mother would have watched her beloved Papa die and would lose the friend that she had clung to only hours before. She would also see people and women, children, elderly walking around with such horrific burns and um, the, the skin melting from them that she couldn't even tell if they were a boy or a girl. And that is definitely what she relived in her nightmares. I'm just gonna quickly share my screen just to show. This is a picture of my mom and her papa. And over the next few years, she would lose the family members that she grew up with. In this picture, um, in this corner here where it's cut out, my mother cut herself out of that picture because she felt guilty that she was the only one that was still alive that day. <clears throat> She was 12 years old. She was too young to really understand why it was all happening, but yet old enough to never forget those images of, and really had the nightmares up until she passed away in 2015 at the age of 82. And at the point when she was telling me about these memories for the first time, she also said that she had planned to commit suicide because all that she loved was taken away from her in the atomic bombing. But she was so glad that she didn't because she now had me and my daughter to love. She also said that I had the same blood flowing through my veins and that I would also find my own new way. She never said much more about August 6th until my daughter was in seventh grade. 
My daughter came home so upset. She had overheard some students talking about that cool mushroom cloud. And she asked if I would go speak to them about the people under the cloud that day, like her grandma. So when I asked my mom, I wasn't sure if she would really say yes because she was so private about it, but she did want me to talk about it. And she said that the students in the class would be about the same age she was when the bomb was dropped and that they might relate to her better. And also she knew that every one of them was going to be a voter someday and that they would know that nuclear weapons should never be used again. And when I spoke to those students, I really wanted to give them an idea of what the culture was like, the daily life, what the political mindset was at that time in Japan. But I also wanted to, them to know that the children in Japan, like my mom, they love their families, they love their friends, they worried what might happen to them, and they wished for peace. And these were all the same things that the allied children were thinking and wishing. I wanted them to know what actually happened to the ordinary citizens in Japan, that even though Hiroshima was a big military port by the time of 1945, there were mostly women and children and elderly there with a few soldiers left. Um, I've had the privilege of speaking with thousands of students all over the world and I have found, they have told me the one thing that really makes them want to take action is the story of that 12 year old little girl in Hiroshima and how easily it could be one of them. And I feel that in order for disarmament treaties and for the statistics to really matter, they have to make a connection to those people under the clouds that day. And no matter how many leaders may come and go and how much technology might change, that need for human connection through our stories, through emotions, that's timeless. Future voters need to know about the lives shattered, the homes, the loved ones lost, and the lifetime of the physical and emotional scars. Whenever nuclear disarmament is discussed, they respectfully mention the over 200,000 people that died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And what also needs to be mentioned is the number of the Korean citizens and the Chinese citizens and some of the POWs that were also in Hiroshima. And those stories should also be told. But they rarely mention the thousands that survived the atomic bombing. And then what happens to their second and third generations as a result of that. And as a second generation baksha, during my childhood, I witnessed my mother's scars. She would have periods of depression where she would sit in a darkened room for days. She would have anger outbursts. Um, she had a lot of survivor guilt and she was afraid of certain things that I didn't understand. And before I was 11, I had no clue why she was doing that. And that of course then affects how I deal with things emotionally now, but I also live with it daily as I battle uh, RSD and the multiple spinal surgeries I've had to have in this past year of learning to walk again with a walker. So from all of this, I also want to say, though, my mother, even though she lost so much, she never lost her ability to love. And I remember when I showed her the publishing contract and she took it and she placed it next to her favorite photo of her and her papa. And she turned to me and she said, I never understood why I was still alive after I lost so many loved ones in the atomic bombing. But now I know I couldn't tell my story. But I had you, and you could tell it for me. She was the bravest person I will ever know. And I'm so honored that she entrusted myself and my daughter with her memories, with her heart. But yet as brave as she was in so many areas, she never felt that she really had a voice to talk about what happened to her in the atomic bombing. Because she felt that people would not be able to separate her from the Axis power of Japan and what the military uh, and the leaders had done during the war. And unfortunately, she did experience that a lot when she first moved to the United States. <clears throat> so I hope that now she can see that I'm so proud to be her voice and that her love 
that she had for me emboldens me to continue to keep speaking through my pain, through my disability, and telling her story. And I hope that when I speak to students, talking to them about the humanity, or when they read The Last Cherry Blossom, that I somehow can plant a small seed of empathy in their hearts that will continue to bloom throughout their life. And I also hope that by joining with associations such as ICMGLT and PGA, um, that I can also work with entities such as May Peace Prevail on Earth or Global Alliance for Sustainable Peace and Prosperity. I, I hope, and it's very difficult now to say that because I wrote this before this morning, that we could ensure that there would be no more victims of nuclear weapons. And I pray that that will continue to be true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. And uh, thank you so much for having shared with us uh, your, your experience, which is, which is unique and is enlightening because it tells us uh, what does it mean to survive such an atrocity as the one that your, your mother suffered and how that has intergenerational, multi-generational legacies. But we, we are so grateful that you, you decided to share this with us. And um, um, unfortunately, the history of the past uh, repeats itself in, in, in new shapes and forms, of course, but um, uh, Dr. Danieli, of course, uh, started the meeting by evoking uh, what happened this morning uh, with the speech of the president of the Russian Federation. And um, I'm now um, giving the floor to our next speaker, who is a member of parliament, speaking from her office in Kiev, Ukraine, uh, Dr. Uh, Galina Mikhailiuk. She's the deputy head of the Parliamentary Committee on Law Enforcement, which is the committee that has the responsibility for uh, legislation and the legal affairs. And she's also a member of Parliamentarians for Global Action. Galina, we are very grateful that you are here with us. The floor is yours. Esteemed members of Parliamentarians for Global Actions Network, distinguished colleagues, first and foremost, allow me to take this opportunity uh, to express uh, my immense gratitude to our trusted partners for solidarity with Ukraine in our struggle uh, for freedom and democratic values. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, I thank everyone who assists our people in any, in every possible way and every small thing, no matter how significant it may seem, could save uh, life here in Ukraine. Uh, we are all keenly aware that on 24th of February 2022, Russia launched a full-scale war against Ukraine using ground forces, aircraft, missile systems, uh, shelling Ukrainian cities and cities and killing civilians, including children. We could not even imagine that the price of our Ukrainian aspirations for freedom and democracy in Europe uh, would be so high. Therefore, we truly appreciate and uh, commend uh, to all our international allies uh, uh, for their clear and consistent stance and invaluable efforts to help Ukrainian people. Uh, at the beginning of the war, we were told that Ukraine uh, will survive like two, three days, no more, and then we will fail as a state. But thanks to you, to our international allies, uh, we are still uh, uh, sovereign and dependent countries. Uh, key priorities that still remain covering military and humanitarian assistance um, is tightening sanctions to the fullest extent. Uh, today, uh, just uh, two hours ago, uh, uh, we had the plenary session here in the Parliament of Ukraine, and the Ministry of Finance presented us uh, our reality in Ukraine and what are the prognosis for, uh, for the next year. And he told that uh, uh, Russian economy suffered only 6% this year uh, of GDP uh, 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 within the sanctions that were provided. So sanctions are actually appear to be too soft, uh, while Ukrainian GDP uh, has already lost 35%. And uh, till the end of the year, the prognosis is minus 45% of GDP compared to the 6% of the Russian one. 
Uh, for Ukraine, time is of utmost importance. Uh, we must promptly cut off all possible resources which enable Kremlin to continue the war. Uh, moreover, Ukraine is uh, deeply grateful for the large amounts of material and financial assistance for the support to our army, to Ukraine, uh, armed forces, to our heroes. And due to the high pressure and efficient NATO standards weapons that uh, we have received, uh, we've managed to counterbalance uh, Russian numerical superiority. And uh, uh, we've managed to have our successful counter operation last week uh, uh, in the area of Kharkiv region. We also feel gratitude uh, to the genuine solidarity and practical aid of foreign, foreign partners um, uh, for those who are responsible uh, in, in bringing to justice those responsible for the barbaric war uh, and war crimes and crimes against humanity that are committed here in Ukraine. Um, actually, uh, on Saturday, we will mark seven months of Russia, uh, Russia's uh, attacking peaceful cities, towns, and villages across Ukraine, across our country, including apartment blocks, hospitals, maternity houses, schools, kindergartens, churches, and cultural cities. And um, I should say that civilian population, as every single day, is constantly and mercilessly shelled and bombed as a result of indiscriminate and predominated uh, attacks. Russian used uh, cluster munitions, phosphorus and vacuum bombs, other weapons prohibited by international humanitarian law. It's a common practice for Russians. That's why here yeah, monitoring evidences of um, their actions indicates the gravity and the scale of Russian blatant violations of international law. Of course, as a state liable uh, on, on the international level as well as individual level for those involved in planning, ordering, uh, executing all these military operations, uh, if Russia will not be held accountable for these uh, appalling war crimes against Ukrainian people, it risks undermining the credibility of international law uh, and rule-based order altogether. So actually, currently, uh, the overwhelming evidences of more than uh, uh, 33,000 of uh, identified war crimes, including genocide. Since August 12, Ukrainian armed forces uh, regained over 9,000 square kilometers uh, in the course of counteroffensive uh, in the east uh, part of our country. And in the areas freed from Russian control, there have been numerous accounts of deliberate killings of civilians, their feet and hands bound, summary executions, torture, rape, sexual assault, mass graves found, um, new mass graves actually found recently in Kharkiv region. The siege attacks preventing humanitarian convoys from entering Ukrainian cities have been used to starve civilians into surrender or to force them to flee as refugees. Russia has done this to more than uh, 1.2 million Ukrainian citizens. So we have 1.2 million Ukrainian citizens um, actually uh, in deportation to Russian Federation. Furthermore, um, articles published by state-owned um, press agencies advocate genocide and they call for the elimination of Ukrainians and the reformation of the country order in a different identity. So this is quite obvious that all the systematic legal um, actions uh, constituting war crimes and uh, crimes against humanity, this is a planned Russian military policy. It's not just a decision of mid-level commanders. So uh, there is a little international precedent uh, uh, in recent decades for putting captured soldiers on trial for war crimes. Nevertheless, uh, the advantage of holding and trial now uh, rather than uh, uh, at the end of the war is that uh, uh, we, we have nowadays access to fresh evidence, including I witness testimonies and we can bolster a case. So this is that is why why Ukrainian war differs from all previous ones that uh, our prosecutors, our police, uh, 
our um, law enforcement agencies in Daltel, they do their best to collect evidences to um, to write down all the important documents that uh, can be used as evidences uh, in international tribunal or international criminal court. So we are not waiting till the end of the war. We do it right now. And Ukrainian authorities uh, act upon primary responsibility to investigate and prosecute uh, violations of international law committed uh, here in Ukraine. I should say that given the scale of atrocities and uh, all the challenge for our authorities alone to store, preserve and hold, and, uh, hold all the evidences uh, during the war times, uh, only domestic prosecution is not enough. Uh, that's why cooperation with, uh, with the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council, with International Criminal Court, and uh, various non-governmental organizations that are working to collect this evidence of war crimes in Ukraine is absolutely crucial. In this context, the role of Eurojust as the hague based EU agency for uh, criminal justice cooperation seems to be instrumental. And um, actually, my committee uh, in June, we had uh, a business trip to the Hague where we had uh, meetings in the Eurojust, uh, in International Criminal Court, uh, um, you know, in, in different, uh, let's say, law enforcement uh, agencies. Uh, we've uh, we've uh, we have now tight uh, cooperation with International Criminal Court, and we've already managed to adopt in the Parliament um, a number of draft laws that were actually drafted together with International Criminal Court, so we could give them, uh, we as legislators, we could give uh, them uh, possibility uh, to help uh, our prosecutors and law enforcement agencies um, to collect evidences and uh, um, to work together so we would make sure that our legislative base is on the same page as we do have it uh, um, in The Hague. Um, so we've also set up uh, joint investigation teams on international uh, crimes committed in Ukraine. And this team consists of prosecutors, police and judges from different countries uh, who come all together under the coordination of Eurojust to synchronize cross-border investigations and bring prosecutors uh, to successful uh, conclusion. The International Criminal Court has already deployed a team of 42 investigators, forensic experts and support personnel to Ukraine to advance uh, its investigations and uh, needs to be able to better cooperate with joint um, investigation teams in the future. Um, if an increased number of EU member states participated in this joint investigation team focused in Ukraine, then such partnership would be really able, uh, efficient, rapid and real-time coordination and exchange the information between the involved parties. I should say that also uh, um, we consider alternative methods of seeking international responsibility for crimes in Ukraine. Uh, that is including uh, universal criminal jurisdictions and uh, ad hoc tribunals. The first one makes it possible for the state to prosecute individual, individuals regardless uh, of their nationality, and then to proceed to its own territory before the state courts uh, for crimes committed beyond the national jurisdictions. On one hand, establishing the International Criminal Tribunal for Ukraine would be the goal for the states, while there is no uh, um, um, unanimity on the international stage, as we know, uh, even the issue of sanctions against Russia uh, or their scope is unfortunately a matter of political and economic uh, disputes. Actually, we've discussed it in the International Criminal Court, what is better to proceed within the separate tribunal uh, or uh, to present the case uh, to the International Criminal Court. And we realize that the International Criminal Court will be overloaded with cases if um, yeah, we will uh, uh, we will uh, go this way. That's why highly likely that international uh, separate tribunal uh, will be more effective uh, um, in Ukrainian uh, uh, war case. The world also needs to understand that uh, aggressively enforced sanctions have the potential uh, to hammer the Russian war machine and that the fail and fiasco in Ukraine has already exposed the deficiencies of Moscow efforts to build a first-rate military. 
That's why uh, enduring sanctions uh, could put um, that objective permanently out of reach by depriving Russian boss of capital to invest in its armed forces and to access the Western technology, such a microprocess for precision guide weapons. Another important factor that I need to mention is um, bringing to justice those responsible for war crimes uh, is direct engagement of global institutions. However, one of the reasons um, why uh, using international institutions uh, to hold Putin's regime accountable seems uh, difficult uh, in Russia's power within them. So therefore, it's critical to launch a long-term campaign and to expel Russia from international organizations. Of course, United Nations Human Rights Council, United Nations Security Council that today and yesterday we have the sessions that are there and we do hope that this small opportunity to, um, to actually kick out Russia from the UN Security Council that uh, it will be supported by other countries. Uh, we've uh, had numerous meetings in the UN, in New York, talking about this, and we do realize uh, the current ground there. But uh, um, Russia uh, also should be face suspension from the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Those rules is that flagrantly already been violated by Russia. And Russia is a country that bombs hospitals, and it has no place on the executive board or of the World Health Organization. Across the UN system, the countries should block the election and appointment of Putin regime officials and to the leadership position. So they should be uh, recognized as persona non grata as well. That's why Russian participation in the summits with US or European leaders should be out of question. Uh, thus, the international community must develop a unified approach to introducing political, economic, and legal measures, um, be committed to systematically maintaining them, and adopt uh, a firm stance on the fight against immunity for the war crimes in Ukraine. I should say that uh, the statistics that I have um, uh, as of 15 September 2002 is that in total we have registered 33,916 crimes of aggression of war in Ukraine, crimes against uh, national security more than 15,000. Uh, we have already 624 suspects uh, um, uh, in the main case of aggression uh, of Russian Federation. And these are representatives of military, political leadership, uh, ministers, deputies, of course, military command and officials. And uh, we have also, of course, UN human rights monitoring mission uh, have documented a range of violations against prisoners of war. Um, you have heard about these cases. Uh, uh, I hope that uh, that while the staff has been granted um, an impeded access to the places of uh, detention of Ukrainian in, on the, in, in the Ukraine controlled territory, Russia has not provided access to the prisoners of war held on its territory uh, or the territory uh, on occupation to Ukrainian uh, side. And uh, of course, uh, um, uh, prisoners of war, uh, they uh, suffer tortures, ill treatment. In some places of detention, they lack adequate food, water, healthcare, and sanitation. And many Ukrainian prisoners, they are reportedly suffering from hepatitis A, tuberculosis, and other infection diseases. And additionally, they have not been allowed to contact their relatives, depriving their families of the right to know what has happened to them. Meanwhile, teachers who have refused to endorse that Russia has called its special military operation in Ukraine, they face uh, retaliation and sanctions. Human rights activists have been arrested, prosecuted for their work, and defense lawyers intimidated. We have filtration camps. We have more than 1,200 kids uh, deported to Russian uh, um, Federation, separated from their uh, families. And actually, uh, Russians, they have adopted the law that allows uh, them to adopt Ukraine, that allows Russians to adopt Ukrainian kids. And we don't know if these kids are treated as, as normal kids or as if they're treated as Nazi kids. There's a huge difference. So that's why 
uh, population on our occupied territories has been subject to so-called filtration, which exposes people and the uh, enforced disappearances, arbitrary errors, torture, and all and ill treatment. I should uh, say that uh, only together, only with the help of our international partners, we can resist and we can win this war. Otherwise, without international help, without your countries, without you, our allies, that would be not possible uh, for us uh, to think about uh, a bright future for Ukraine. Um, I've recorded that uh, um, um, it was mentioned about lost generation. And I should say that uh, when the war started, uh, I, was, I was 34, now I'm 35. And my generation was called lost generation. So basically being 35, uh, because of Russian invasion to Ukraine, I have no future uh, as uh, other people say, uh, because like no one knows what, what will happen tomorrow. Actually, how we live in Ukraine, we don't have even plan for tomorrow because you don't know um, if you will be alive in the evening. So it's hard to plan your life because before invasion, I was planning, uh, I was thinking about marriage, about children, Nowadays, you think, uh, okay, we like to be buried in Kiev or in Odessa, like, you know, the completely different thoughts. Uh, thank you a lot uh, for, uh, for invitation to this um, online event, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, uh, looking forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Honorable uh, Mikhail Luke, and, and you really brought us into, into what is going on. You really gave us an holistic point of view and uh, we are here for the future so all together i think uh, listening to you means for us to to take even more responsibility if we can to to support the rights of victims of the crime of aggression because this is happening today and and we we would not have believed that this could have been could have been even possible during our lifetime um now um i am very honored to give the floor to our last contributor from a direct situation uh, involving these atrocity crimes. Uh, Mr. Victor uh, Oken is the founder and executive director of the African Youth Initiative Network and is based in Uganda. He is a UN a Global Ambassador for Peace and Justice under the SDG, Sustainable Development Goal 16. He is a Global Advisor on Gender, Force Displacement and Protection so of the UN HCR, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and is also in the Advisory Council of the ICMGLT, our, our co-sponsor. Victor, please, please take the floor. Before we begin, Victor, remember this? Yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I re oh, oh, wow. Okay, okay. Uh, this is actually the event in Kampala where Victor and I met uh, yes. the first time. Uh, uh, there was a football game for the victims. <laughs> of yeah. All, of, all, all the ICC folks. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. With the kids. So uh, I just wanted to surprise you and oh. walk me away <laughs> further. It, Thank you. And you did a good job. You really surprised me so much. Thank you so much for... <laughs> For the memory. Uh, if and you're here, it, this is waiting for you when you get to New York. I will. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you also, my David and the previous speakers for the wonderful deliberation. I greet everybody. I'm in Kampala, Uganda right now. And as I've been introduced, I was born in this part of uh, the world. And I, I grew up in Uganda. I happen to be a, one of the uh, survivors of conflict, the long years of conflict that took uh, forever in my country. But also uh, having been born in the war zone, I was born in the camp, I was, I was raised in the camp. I spent my first 20 years as a human being, I spent in the active violent conflict where abductions were on daily basis. And also, uh, you know, killings, live alone, the displacement. I was one of the millions of people displaced for not two years, not for three years, but for 20 years. So to me, uh, war is pretty much what I grew up witnessing on a daily basis. The life 
of movement, the life of migration, the life of displacement is the life I grew up uh, experiencing entirely. But also, most importantly, uh, along the way, of course, at some point as a human being, you reach a point where you are sick and tired of your own suffering. And you would want to be able to change the life you're living to a better life. And in that context, the question that we ask ourselves is, how can we transform our trauma, our pain, and our suffering into an opportunity for leadership that brings about peace, that speaks uh, for justice, that demands for accountability? And that was the motivation that drove us to get that from where we are, from our own suffering. We never had any hope when I, when I had my sister from Ukraine spoke about and said, uh, she was 34 when war started, and now she's 35. And, you know, with the reality that you don't know what you're going to do the next day, this is a, a very lost environment that you, you may not have so much to do. This is the environment I grew up in. This is the life I survived for over 20 years. And then I became an active player in my own fate. Of course, at some point, as young as I was, I was tired and afraid of being abducted and recruited as a child soldier. And at, I was eight, I was 13 years old when I started my first peace club in the camp, primarily to challenge the child soldiers recruitment, which was being done by the rebels of the Lord Resistance Army. And the government of Uganda too, were doing recruitment of children uh, as auxiliary forces to fight alongside uh, the government troops. So these are realities that you grew up witnessing and you grew up struggling to get away from. Relating to today, the victim's rights to truth, the victim's right to justice and international mechanisms that exist. How can we use those pillars, those platforms to make peace and justice a reality, not just academic paper documents or policies or frameworks or conventions, but how can we transform that into an opportunity and so that it's a reality. We're aware that in most cases, with even what we're seeing, in most cases, we're aware that international humanitarian response has always been led by the global north. It has always been a superpower oriented uh, development. And to the point that it has it's always made it very difficult for people, uh, especially from places like from Africa, to find yourself, what can you do where? You find yourself vulnerable, but you have to sit and wait because the approach, the mobilization, the support was always a superpower oriented, Eurocentric, a global north uh, kind of centered intervention. However, the recent development or the recent conflict we're seeing right now in Ukraine, it has exposed the fragility and vulnerability of the post. Cold War uh, superpower driven conflict response. We have seen this. For example, yes, heavy focus has been on militarization and provision of even more sophisticated weapons as aid. And this has, in many ways, created ground for massive confrontation. That's what we saw on our side as Africans the Ukrainians are calling for support, global support, and the global communities have responded so very well with military capabilities to facilitate and support Ukraine to defend themselves. And of course, additionally, as I, I you know, I, I highlighted that one, additionally, you also need to know that if humanitarian or international, you, you know, response support is you know, restricted, not primarily restricted, but it's more concentrated in one part of the world. We have also seen that it depletes the other parts of the corners of the world, their capacity as other region to respond and provide support of this nature. But of course, in a way, the experience that we have sometimes far away from us may be necessary, may be needed. I remember when war started in Ukraine and then around, Around, around April were contacted, my organization was contacted by experts, psychologists and psychiatrists who are working to support victims and survivors of war, especially women of sexual violence and children who are displaced. 
in the current war in Ukraine were contacted. If INET, my organization that has been working in this part of the world, of course, unfortunately, they contacted knowing that the skills that existed on working with women who are sexually abused, the skill that uh, exists work with working with children who are separated, children witnessed their parents killed or die during war. This skill has unfortunately been deeper in Africa. So when they contacted, they said, yes, we have expert psychologists and psychiatrists here in Europe, in America, who are doing a fantastic job, but most of them do not have experience working in a practical conflict zone. So that's where they called us. They acted, uh, they asked us, they requested us to provide any kind of support. So I'm happy to say over the last two months, three months, two, three months, we have been providing virtual training and support for the Ukrainian psychiatrists and psychologists who are in the front line, who are working on, especially with the relevant skills in working to provide support for women who are victims of sex as a weapon of war. Uh, the children we have seen, we have had stories where children, two children in one family, where both parents are fighting on both sides of the conflict. And these kids feel so torn apart. They're wondering, their father is fighting on the Ukrainian side, their mother is fighting on the Russian side, and they're fighting about, against each other. And then they're saying, what do we do in this kind of situation? Because we can't, we, there was never a moment that we needed our parents more than now, but they have all picked up the gun to fight against each other. And these are the expression from the kids in conflict. And then they're asking, we ask them, would you want one of them to come back? And then say, no, we'd rather not have any of them come back because we know if they come back, we'll accuse that person of having killed other parents. So, and they are now saying, we hear the languages being spoken as the language that atrocities are being committed. So these are the kind of things that the dynamics that we are working on and we are trying to see that in as much as it has been bad in Africa, the skills that have been there working with this very desperate kind of people, the victims, the, the survivors who are struggling with their own reality in the community. We do have it in Africa. And that was a clear message that to us, responding to the global humanitarian crisis will not need one region, we need all of us, we need all of us. And then also another concern that has emerged is in so many ways, the psych communities, the psychiatric, the psychologist communities may be at risk of uh, being subjected for military agenda if we don't know. So the question is, how do we work towards maintaining the integrity of psych communities, the psychiatrists and psychologists, so that we don't legitimize war, but we stand to speak the truth because we have realized that circumstances in other countries, not only in, in Europe, but also in other parts of Africa, where they are being called to validate, to tell, to detect if the persons arrested is telling the truth or telling the lies and their judgment, their statement is final, determines whether that person lives or not. Lastly, we had to come up with a comprehensive agenda as my organization, as INET in Africa, because we now know that our skills in Africa is needed in the global South. Because as we have always taken support and skills in the global South, in, in, in the global North, we also need to see what can we do to support our brothers and sisters in the global north. And that's why we are saying that this is an opportunity for global solidarity, a global collaboration. And to that extent, we came up with how do we mobilize experts from the global south, from Africa. We've been doing this from South Africa, from Uganda, from Ethiopia, from even Argentina, from India, other places. And we are trying to say, can we provide a pro bono mental health support or pro bono psychosocial support training experience for our brothers and sisters who are doing in the front line in Europe in the current situation. And then secondly, in our continued organizing of the virtual mental health training and supporting the frontliners who are actively involved, we want to continue maintaining this. But of course, we hope that at some point soon, we could arrange the in-person Global South learning journey so that we bring the experts psychologists and psychiatrists, professionals from Europe, from America, come to Africa, we work together for a period of two weeks, learn from South Africa, learn from Uganda, and we see how can we be present in Europe just like we have been present in, 
in, in Africa. And then very lastly, if we can, we should be able to support and coordinate activities, the mental health. Hopefully, early next year, we shall have maybe a global or international conference for the site communities to su provide support for the women, especially women and children in armed conflict. So these are practical steps we are taking, and we hope some learning that we cannot run away from, 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 from Ukraine. You know, aware how things have become, uh, you know, you have demonstrated strength in the face of adversity. I think the people of Ukraine have really told us that the current situation needs strength that can, can, can only come from within, not even from outside. But also we need to understand that the humanitarian work model, which used to happen before, is not possible in the current global complex reality. So responsibility should be distributed globally so that we know we are fairly responsive, we are fairly responding or preventing atrocities in any other parts of the world. So we can borrow from African model of resilience. We can learn from the Asian model of where development is rooted in people's culture and in their own people. And we can also understand and appreciate the Europe and Americans or the global North historical response in humanitarian situation. We need to understand the fragility that comes with militarizing the already poor, angry and weakened population. How much would that do in terms of supporting global peace agenda? I thank you very much. And I hope from where we can start developing a strategy and see how we can work together. And we are giving our best part as Africans. We cannot deliver military aid, but we can deliver our resilient skills. We have seen in Africa where war criminals even turned up to become presidents and we still got along. So that kind of resilience is what can we do now for the sake of protecting the life of the people who have suffered for so long. And I think this is what we can provide and the advice I can give to my friends and colleagues all over the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Victor. And uh, thank you for emphasizing the crucial importance of the mental health professions uh, in this. Uh, actually, the center is involved in, with Ukraine uh, uh, mental health professionals. We actively uh, in, are involved in training and advising. So that would uh, be good to do. And, uh, your your idea of uh, capitalizing on the human resources of Africa, when you say no resources, you have amazing human resources. When you're talking about the amazing human resources and capitalizing uh, them on them, not only Africa, but the South in general, uh, you are breaking into an open door, I'm sure with PGA also. Uh, yeah. And your invitation to to have a conference that is grand. Uh, if you wish, we can start it with a series of online conferences yeah. and then yeah. culminate it as a on on in person uh, yeah. meeting. Uh, but yeah. this is absolutely doable, and uh, yeah. I think we are all anxious to in fact do that to get together to do good. Uh, so this is a brilliant idea. Thank you so much. And thank you for, for focusing on the struggle for the good and for resilience yeah. and for the opportunity. And um, David, if you want to add anything, please. Thank you, Yael. And, and our last speaker is, is not the last. It's going to be a, a starting point for all of us. Professor Dr. Klaus Kress is the special advisor to the ICC prosecutor on the crime of aggression and was the main, one of the main drafters of the um, definition of the crime of aggression itself, which is found in the Kampala, Victor, the Kampala amendments to the Rome Statute. So everything goes back to your wonderful country. Professor Kress is also uh, directing a, a very important center at the University of Cologne, um, which is the uh, Institute of International Peace and Security Law and is a professor of uh, German and international criminal law 
at Cologne University. Professor Kress, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, first of all, Dr. Danieli, uh, dear Yael, um, whom I have seen and admired for a number of decades of dedicated work in support of victims. And I also wish to thank you and through you, David, PGA. You have been and you remain a critical voice, a critically important voice on the way of our discussions about international criminal justice. And as we know today, uh, it is still an unfinished discussion. And that we come together today could not be more timely. It's, it could, be, could not be more urgent in view in particular of the recent announcements by the Russian president. And let me say at the outset um, how privileged I feel that you are with us, honorable deputy from uh, the Ukraine. Um, I have listened to every single word you said with um, the greatest attention, the greatest affection, and the greatest admiration. I also wish to thank all those who have spoken before me, and they have spoken much more powerfully than I can, because they have spoken with the unique authority of people suffering and have given us their accounts of um, past egregious crimes and of those catastrophic events that we are currently witnessing in the Ukraine. I can only speak and I emphasize this with much less authority on certain legal aspects, legal policy aspects, but aspects which nevertheless may also be of some uh, importance in our uh, joint endeavors. But let me perhaps add one personal word, especially to you, Madam Deputy. We have accepted a mother and uh, a daughter from Ukraine in our house right after the beginning of the war as refugees. A wonderful little daughter of six years. I felt like I am an old father, but I felt as a young father when I took Diana to school in Germany. And uh, she's learning the German language since she is in school in a rapid speed, uh, which is, again, <laughs> a source of a daily admiration for me. I'm saying this because a part or in addition to my legal studies, we are through those two, Ivana and Diana, a little closer um, to you and your people. We can follow her calling, speaking with her husband who is back in Ukraine every day, informing us about the bombs falling upon the country every day and every night. And uh, so I'm just mentioning this, that you have a sense that it is not exclusively in the abstract when I now turn to the law. And as um, the organizers um, have very appropriately uh, chosen to focus on the crime of aggression today, not of course belittling for a second war crimes, crimes against humanity and all the others, but for a very good reason, they have chosen to focus on the crime of aggression. I will devote my few observations to this crime. The Ukraine war, Russians war of aggression against Ukraine is not only if this were not enough, 
a violation of the prohibition of the use of force. I think it is hard to recall a case where the prohibition of the use of force that the International Court of Justice has called a cornerstone of the United Nations Charter has been violated in such a manner in terms of intensity and purpose. So in that sense, it is difficult to think of a pre precedent despite a number, and we all know those, most regrettable violations of the prohibition of the use of force in the past. It's not the first one, unfortunately, but in terms of intensity and purpose, it is hard to think of a precedent that resembles what we are currently witnessing. And this shows us with regard to the crime of aggression that we have still not reached a satisfactory legal architecture to appropriately deal with crimes of aggression. And I should say, and this is why I believe that the organizers have rightly chosen the, the crime of aggression, because the ultimate function, and this function has been the function since the inaugurating moment, so to speak, in the Nuremberg trial. And I'm saying this as a citizen of Germany, whose um, nationals so rightly were the objects of those historic investigations and prosecution. But from the outset, the crime of aggression, it was called crimes against peace at the time. And just allow me for a second to remind you where this term has come from. The term has been invented by a Soviet international lawyer, Aaron Trainin. It's um, hard to believe and to mention this at present. But from the outset, the idea of criminalizing aggression was to devote or to vest the international community with an instrument to strengthen the prohibition of the use of force and to give recognition to the victims. And this purpose has probably since the entry into force of the United Nations Charter with the prohibition of the force never been as important uh, as today. Now, why is the situation still unsatisfactory? You all know this and I will not go into the details because the hands of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, whom to serve as an advisor, I have the honor are tied with respect to that crime in particular, because the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, the first permanent, permanent international court in history is too limited. I'm not going into technical details, but the fact that the aggressor state, Russia, is not party to the ICC statute currently ties the prosecutor's hands. Why is this jurisdiction too limited? Well, first of all, let's face it, because of regrettable power politics. And here, let us also be honest, Russia certainly has been part of those power politics, but not exclusively because of Russia. The overwhelming majority of countries of delegations were in favor of a better jurisdictional regime. And as we have just listened to a distinguished speaker from Africa, I say at the outset, African states, South American states, there were very important Asian states. We have listened to a distinguished 
colleague from Korea. Korea was very important in those delegations, but regrettably in particular five permanent, and I say five, not one, five permanent members of the Security Council and some others have ultimately prevailed. And so the jurisdiction is too limited. Second, there is another reason and that goes beyond power politics. It is a conceptual problem that still haunts us today. And I was so grateful to you, Yael, that you have in passing made the point already in your introduction. A very unfortunate distinction has come to be largely accepted in international talk and dialogue. That between three atrocity crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and the allegedly different crime against humanity, uh, crime, crime of aggression. The, by, the idea behind this distinction is that there are no victims in the case of crimes of aggression, except from the, and some say, anachronistic value of state sovereignty. As if there were no individual victims in cases of wars of aggression. That must sound very, very odd, this idea to our, especially now to the honorable deputy from Ukraine. No, I think we must overcome this conceptual confusion and recognize that the crime of aggression is not fundamentally different from the others. It can be, as is the case in the ongoing war, it can be what I would call the original sin. And the Nuremberg Tribunal in its judgment has said something very similar with regard to Germany's egregious wars of aggression. It can be the original sin from which so many other atrocities follow. There is no reason to sideline, to belittle the crime of aggression and only call the other crimes atrocity crimes. The Human Rights Committee of the United Nations has understood it in its recent general comment on the right to life. It has made it clear that every act of killing in the course of an aggression constitutes by itself a violation to the right of life. We only have to draw the lessons from this insight. And that now brings me to the question of remedies. What can we do if the current system is imperfect? I'm not belittling the advances that we have made to again return to Kampala. Kampala was an, a historic moment and I have advocated to go through the open window that was open there to make that step. But we now see the step was not courageous enough and we have to continue moving. And it is PGA's merit to have made what I would consider the most principled proposal to remedy the situation to date. And this is to solve the problem where it should be ultimately solved within the ICC statute. The ICC is and it will remain the only permanent international criminal jurisdiction that we have implying a major advance in terms of the international rule of law. It is there that the crime of aggression should be prosecuted in the future. And when I say this, I'm saying this looking beyond Ukraine. It should be prosecuted within the aspiration to the basic principle of equal op application of international law in all cases. Or even more importantly, it should send the message out in every corner of the world not to commit crimes of aggression in the future. That's the most benign 
purpose of the ICC. And what the um, PGA's proposal to amend the ICC statute and to do away with the current jurisdictional restraints achieves is just that, to vest this jurisdiction with a better jurisdictional basis. And I would humbly call to all states, including those who have been restrictive in the past, one can always learn and do better. Now, to appreciate this moment of um, existential threat, first of all, to the Ukraine and its people, but also, as it has been said, to the international legal order and to try to do better. Everybody knows it would be a demanding venture. Everybody who has taken part in the negotiations on the ICC will know that it's demanding to change and to improve. But we have proven repeatedly it's possible to do it. And we, I think, need those crystallizing moments for a new momentum. And should that not be a moment to bundle forces and to work in that direction? So thank you, uh, PGA, for making this courageous step forward. I wish to add one word because I know that it is important to Ukraine and the Ukrainians, and I completely understand it. This realization of PGA's proposal will need time. Let's be realistic. An amendment of the ICC statute is not something that can be achieved overnight. But Ukraine, the Ukraine, in my view, rightly demands a message now about not only war crimes, crimes against humanity, but also the crime of aggression. And this is the background for the Ukrainian proposal to establish, and the Honorable Deputy has mentioned it, as part of the comprehensive package that Ukraine has been presenting in the recent past, the establishment of a special tribunal. And if this proposal is understood as part of a more lasting solution that PGA has submitted as, a, as an element of transition in a way similar to the ICTY and the ICTR that have helped paving the way to the establishment of the ICC, then I think the proposal made by the Ukraine is not only, and that's good already, good for the immediate and legitimate demands of the Ukrainians, but also for the international legal order itself. So in that sense, I also wish to, to pay tribute to um, Ukrainians' initiatives in that respect. And I'm very pleased that the Committee of Ministers of the European Council has just last Friday noted this proposal, and I quote, with interest, and I'm sure that the president of the Ukraine will today um, add um, to what so many representatives of the Ukraine have been saying in recent days. So let me conclude with two sentences. We all, I think, admire the Ukrainian people for their exemplary braveness since many months now. But I think it's not enough to admire. We have to take action. And the world needs to stay steadfastly in their support, in its support with the Ukraine under this existential threat. And we are all, I think, under a moral duty to do what we can to strengthen at this moment of deep crisis, the international legal order. And once again, the co-organizers of this event have very rightly and appropriately chosen one, of course, one of many, but one very important element. They have helped us 
to focus on the crime of aggression, a crime which is undoubtedly an international crime under existing customary international law, but which still tends for many reasons, not benign, to be sidelined and to be neglected until these days. This should change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, you really covered uh, the entire spectrum that we wanted to cover uh, through your, your intervention and, and even more and even more. And um, I think uh, we are, um, we have almost exhausted our time, but what I would like to call upon is maybe to know if uh, you want to comment each other's interventions. I know that each of your presentations has been so enlightening and, and so full of content that I think there is not so much to, to disagree with each other, but I would leave you as panelists uh, to have this privilege to eventually comment on each other before we open a very brief debate with the participants. I see nobody asking for the floor. And I think if I can say one thing, I see the rights of the victims are the right to know the truth, to access to justice, to apply for reparations, have guarantees of non-repetition, receive any sort of possible, possible satisfaction. We are, victims are not living in another world. They, they want what is humanly possible. Uh, so this is too. And this is valid also for the crime of aggression, not only for genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes. And there is no hierarchy, by the way, because the crime of aggression in Ukraine has opened the door to all the other atrocity crimes. Maybe that is not the case in, in Rwanda, where we had a genocide, of course, without an aggression. I see in the debate our honorable member from Albania, former Minister of Justice, uh, Honorable John I. Please, uh, Honorable. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, really, thank you for the presentation of panelists. Uh, uh, really, they were very interesting. And of course, some of the issues that uh, we have heard, of course, that we have faced or addressed in different ways in our uh, national policies or legislation or when we have ratified international conventions. But really, I was uh, very, um, uh, very interested to, to discuss on, especially on the victims' rights. Of course, that we know very well that how important has to be recognized, especially the victims of war crimes, but what it, it is in the end of the day, and I've heard really uh, with very, uh, with uh, a lot of emotion, um, uh, Kathleen presentation, because we know very well that re that um, recognizing the the war crimes uh, and uh, the victims of war crimes it's one thing, but in on the other side we as member of parliament as politicians we have to find the way how to address better that not just only uh, being recognized but even how that we can offer protection to the victims uh, war crimes. And uh, of course that Albania has no this kind of stories, histories about war crimes. But uh, what we have seen even in our region, there are a lot of cases and issues and might be even some joint initiatives to see that how the services that could be offered to the war crimes, even nowadays, even in Ukraine uh, case, we have Bosnia Herzegovina, we have Kosovo. So we have to understand how we can address better that these victims could have the services, especially on the access to justice. And despite that we have had different policies on the access, access of justice, we know very well that even in Albanian legislation, the rights are separated in different uh, legal frameworks, such as our criminals, such as our, um, as, a, as I mentioned, legal aid, uh, or some part are in social services, but why not having something that is a unique, a unified package, just only for uh, the rights, for protecting the rights of the victims of war crimes. And of course, there are 
a lot of other social and economic issues and rights that are related with what the victims' war crimes deserves. So this is my interventions. I have seen even on, in Albania legislation that uh, even for the other victims, uh, for domestic violence, uh, juveniles, uh, different other target groups, we have some separated pieces of legislation everywhere. But instead, we need to have such as a unified, and why not, especially for having that such as a from uh, PJ uh, for having a unified um, legislation that, of course, I know very well and really because I know very well how powerful is to have and uh, to, to take joint initiatives, especially by the politicians all over the world. Thanks a lot and congratulations. And really thank you for all the presentation of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable. And your, your question included partly the answer because as you suggested, a legislative initiative in your own country, Albania, as well as in other countries were needed to affirm the rights of the victims. And maybe um, uh, Yael wants to uh, further elaborate on the um, aspects of uh, psychosocial support. One thing that is unique to the crime of aggression vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other crimes is that it covers the people who are not protected persons under international humanitarian law. So while war crimes victims are civilians, are those off the combat, outside the combat, in the crime of aggression, also the soldiers who are sent to die at war for no good reason, in violation of the law, as Professor Kress explained to us, also they are victims. So this helps us expand the class of the victims to also the foot soldiers, those who are sent to die in the name of an illegal despot and those who die on the other side. Unfortunately, the Ukrainian victims of the war on the army side are not victims of war crimes because it's it's lawful to kill them regretfully under international humanitarian law. But it's a crime of it's part of the crime of aggression when they die. It's a result of the crime of aggression, and they should be considered victims of the crime of aggression. I see here in the list Maybe, of uh, yes, go ahead, Yael. I would actually like to comment on that. Yeah. Indeed, uh, in uh, one of our commenter Harold Kudler. Uh, in the chat, indeed, is pointing out what the center is built on, which is the multidisciplinarity of everything we are talking about. And that is, of course, already uh, uh, scientizing things, because the truth is that we are speaking about different ways of formulating victimization and different ways of responding to it. So, yes, uh, the psychosocial aspect is extremely important, but Honorable, please let me thank you. It's not my place, really, for the Albanian uh, way of, of protecting Jewish uh, refugees during World War II. Uh, uh, many, many I, people I know, and there's a friend of mine made a film on it, Many people I know are living today because Albania helped. So I'm very pleased to be able to thank you in public for that and to put it on record. And what you Enough. offered people was compassion. You offered them a home. You offered them a place to live and a place to feel as a part of a, a, a human, peaceful community. And uh, this is part of what would be helpful to Ukrainians and to everyone. Uh, I mean, uh, let's not forget the, the war in the DRC that's been going on forever and ever too, Victor. Uh, uh, two things I want to mention. I put in the chat a reference to an event we're doing on Tuesday on the International Day for the Elim Elimination of, uh, of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, so please, if you're interested, uh, join us. But also to add to both what Klaus and David were saying. Um, one of the, the body of people we don't talk about are the military 
what do countries owe their own militaries? Not only the, the military of the enemy. Uh, and uh, we, our next, next uh, webinar in this series on the crime of aggression will indeed focus on the effect of participating in the act of aggression on the people who are actually uh, doing it uh, with willingness or not, with knowing why or not, with uh, feeling betrayed later when they found out they gave li their lives for not for what they thought they were doing. Uh, so we are in our next webinar, I'm making an announcement and please, uh, and of course with PGA, no question, and perhaps with others, uh, it, we, if PGA agrees, of course, I'm assuming we are in this in the long haul, and hopefully with Klaus too, uh, and with all of our participants, but uh, with those who will talk about the cost incurred emotionally, socially, economically, etc., by veterans, uh, and uh, it, 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 uh, and, and we will have also as participants, veterans organizations such as Veterans for Peace. Uh, so I wanted to announce that because the whole map of the crime of aggression is not only against a country or a government. The, the map, the human map of the crime of aggression is huge and we must attend to it. Uh, so, class, be ready to comment on whether soldiers have rights vis-a-vis -vis their own government, not just vis-a-vis uh, -vis somebody else's government. <laughs> I think that's another thing the crime of aggression should amend, if possible at all. <laughs> so, uh, let's go on. David, the floor is yours again. Yes. I saw one comment that was withdrawn because uh, Professor Traham highlighted in, in the chat that there are on, other ongoing uh, wars of aggression and, um, and, and immense suffering that they are producing also on, on, on the soldiers, not only on, on the civilians, of course. Um, and I think what I would like to do as we exhausted our time, maybe to ask um, uh, a final word from our panelists, uh, if they feel like uh, saying something. If, if, if I can comment on Klaus' presentation, just to say that the proposal of PGA to eliminate from the ICC statute those clauses that are blocking the jurisdiction of the court um, on Ukraine and on future crimes of aggressions uh, committed in similar circumstances, we found out that a lot of our interlocutors were very supportive of the idea, yet nobody among the state delegations to the assembly of the state parties, there are 123, nobody took it and tabled it. So um, that's the real you know, negative news that I need to report to you. So I don't know if Albania was in the Security Council or one other country was represented today. I see the honorable members of the parliament from Malawi, from Seychelles, from other countries. We need to work together on this. Uh, for some reason in the European Union, one permanent member of the Security Council might have blocked all the others. That's a presumption that I have. I have no evidence of this, so I hope, I hope to be wrong, but that's the impression we received when the European Parliament tried to add the crime of aggression to the Eurojust regulation enlisting all the atrocity crimes, and it was blocked by, uh, by the chair of the EU at that time, which was France. And I think and it was done in the corridor. So we have no record to, to prove that this happened. I think that we need really to work very hard with our governments, our countries, those who represent us, so that they can fix this mistake. In the meantime, as Professor Kress said, we need to support the request of Ukraine to create an international or internationalized forum in which to bring to justice those who are, in my view, self-incriminating themselves. Because how do I define the speech of today of President Putin? Self-incrimination. He's declaring his crimes to the, to the world public. So uh, I think it would be a very easy case to prove if that crime was uh, justiciable. I see honorable uh, 
Mila Mikaliuk that wants to speak, and then Professor Kress, honorable. Dear colleagues, uh, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, as a final remark, uh, um, I want to tell you that when the war started uh, on 24th of uh, uh, February, half past 4 a.m., Half past five a.m. I was in this room in my cabinet mm -hmm. because uh, urgently we called each other and we realized that we need to convene an urgent parliamentary meeting. And then seven a.m. we voted for the military stance we are now in. Um, as you see, like seven months after, we are still we are still working. We do our best for our country to win. Uh, of course, Parliament has a different mode of work now. But uh, we will do our best to go to the end, till the victory. We are not afraid of anything at this point. We are not afraid of nuclear threats. We've discussed it in the family, in the parliament. If this will happen, uh, it will be quick and it will be much easier, uh, let's say, for us to survive than the tortures that unfortunately our kids, uh, ladies and gentlemen faced in Bucha, Izumir, Pin, and uh, all uh, other um, small cities that were under occupation, uh, under occupation of Ukraine. We do realize that our bravery is not enough, just the bravery of Ukrainian uh, soldiers, Ukrainian people, and our commitment from MPs and all the government that only with the help of international society we can win. Uh, but um, we, we as Ukrainians, we have no choice. We realize it. I do realize it. My, 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 my personal family, they will not pass the filtration because of me. So there is no way they can stay, stay alive on the occupied Ukrainian territory. And this, I, I, uh, for me, it was shocking that I need to think about it. I need to tell about this in the present day world, thinking about filtration and all this stuff, uh, the deportation that we are, we are having. Uh, I'm very much grateful for your time, for all your um, help that you are granting to Ukraine, to Ukrainian people. And uh, I do realize that uh, we are facing winter time, there is energy crisis, inflation all over the world, uh, that uh, all the countries have their own issues, business and problems. Uh, but uh, only together we can win, the democracy can win. And uh, uh, this, uh, this situation that Russia puts the whole world in front of the threat, uh, that uh, it should be punished. It can, in a free democratic world where we have international order, it cannot be like this, that you just come to the neighbor kill, rape, just want to take the territory, to put the genocide, to delete the history of the whole country, of Ukrainian society, and say that it's, it's ours, you know, we don't want you to exist. So thank you for your help, thank you for your time, for your devotion, and I really enjoyed uh, uh, participation in this uh, great event. It was my pleasure um, to be present here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Professor Kress? Mm, David, quite frankly, um, I had a few things to say, but after listening to the Honorable Deputy, um, I feel it would be completely inappropriate um, to add. Let me just say one word, uh, Madam. I deeply admire you for all you, all what you have been saying today, and uh, I think you speak for your brave people, and uh, um, there is not much more than admiration, I have to say at this moment. I see also Victor. Victor, ask for the floor, please, Victor. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, all my colleagues, the speakers, and also the leaders, the political leaders in the house. I just want to still reaffirm uh, our commitment as a world we are in. We say that human pain and human suffering has got no color and no gender. We are all in it together. And whether in, in Africa or whether in Europe and anywhere in the world. And you know, I was there, I was part of the, I uh, was in the house when there were discussion about the crime of aggression was taking place in Kampala. And like a uh, professor talked about it very clearly. Uh, I think there was the myth that war and suffering was a distant reality. Yeah. People thought it would always be 
them down there. Uh, they thought war would always be in Africa. It's an African thing, never about the people. But, you know, with the world we are in today, war is the next door. You know, we don't have to wait until when suffering rings our doorbell, then they start reacting because it will be too late. When you listen to my sister Kathleen's story, it's a, it's a story of many children. There are so many untold stories, as painful as it will always be. But the question is, who listens to those stories? I think that's the most important. We may not change the political leadership right now to think and accept our reality, but we can plant in new seeds in our children, in the young generation, so that we break in the chains of intergenerational transfer of trauma that has kept the world in the dark side of the history. The future will be very difficult if we don't do much right now. We have seen it, it can happen. There's a reason why those heavy military weaponization was taking place. Manufacturing of this advanced milit you know, militarism, it was meant to always be used against somebody. Maybe we need to look how do we demilitarize, most importantly, an area we can do, the psych and humanitarian community so that we serve people, we help support the local and vulnerable population work towards empowering these young people. I think that would be an opportunity. We can break, break, the, you know, break the chain and bring an end to this kind of suffering. Thank you so much. I know Africa is in the mix in all this. There's already a lot of competition. We have seen uh, even Russian government officials, senior Russian government officials coming to Africa, European and American, they're also coming here. But I think, as I said earlier on, we need to look down where is Africa, where's the global south in the global affairs. Africa is missing, the voice is missing at the United Nations. We're talking about the superpower. If, um, unless we change that mentality, it will be difficult to solve the global crisis as long as the other key players in the global affairs are sidelined, are excluded. I think that's really what we need to do. And we have to work on what we get wisdom of professor and many other people. Looking forward to working together with you. Thank you so much. Victor, your voice should, should also be heard by the Security Council uh, to, to, to remember to include Africa in it, indeed. But there are people from Africa in the, who registered, so don't, please don't feel alone. <laughs> Go, uh, I think um, our Honorable from Albania still wants to speak. Or Thank you. I don't want to be impolite and to take the floor two times, but just only to add something um, about the Security Council. Of course, that uh, you know very well that Albania has been uh, together with US on uh, co-signing uh, even about for the resolution about Ukraine and for everything that could be needed uh, on our side uh, as member of the parliaments together uh, with the uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, I can have a discussion and of course that uh, making the push that is needed for the, this kind of uh, decision or amendments that have to be done for aggression crimes. But on the other side, I want just only to add something because the same initiative, it's even uh, being discussed and uh, in process in uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, since I'm member there, and of course, that if you need something that we can share together uh, and I can share with you, uh, I would be glad everything that is needed in order to be in the same line uh, with all international organisms. And why not uh, even with the uh, uh, Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe? Thanks a lot again. And very Thank admiration you. for the colleague Thank from Ukraine government. And, and I hope that you can join the PGA annual forum and consultative assembly of parliamentarians on the ICC and the rule of law. Because if you are available to come to Argentina in early November, you are in the speaker's list after your today's intervention eh, in a very prominent <laughs> position. So please uh, remain in touch with us. And uh, Yael, before that we close the meeting, I really want to say here that Parliamentarians of Global Action is deeply, deeply grateful, especially to Kathleen, Victor, uh, of course, Galina and, and Ethan for their incredible experiences that they decided to share with us. Very different, but they show that what happened in the past, we haven't learned it today. 
So uh, we need now to really unite our forces. Uh, and if we were uh, having the Spanish language, we would have had a voice from Latin America for sure today in addition to yours, because we have not learned le the lessons of the history and our children and, and our uh, men and women are still dying out of illegal wars or, or crimes against humanity, war crimes and genocide. So I think uh, there is a lot of work to be done and we are very grateful for the partnership, Yael, uh, Yael with you. So I, I, I leave you the, the, the floor for the conclusion. Thank you, David. I thought uh, I, was, I was going to give you the floor for the conclusion, but thank you. <laughs> But you, <laughs> you've been a gentleman it, it, again, it, which which is a part of your wonderful presence in the world. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm. I'm. I mean, I don't have much to say, and I don't have words to say how grateful I am for for the work with PGA. Uh, We've been David. We've been working together for four decades. I don't. Re, I don't even remember. Uh, it, and and it's always it always leads to the to, to to a step forward, which which is which contributes to hope, which contri which we so desperately need. Uh, wait, did, Ethan, you want to say something? Uh, I see. Well, at any rate, Ethan was this. Uh, Just a comment. Was mentioning. Please say it out loud. You're not interrupting me. I'm interrupting me. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, yeah, when the the present war broke out earlier this year, uh, I had a chance to speak uh, with a Ukrainian student here, and uh, she vividly told me that uh, this this uh, invasion began in February 2014, not like this uh, year, and that uh, yeah, the the fact the the world's failure to react uh, perhaps uh, more strongly uh, as it should have done back then, uh, as we were seeing the consequences of that uh, the uh, that inaction. Uh, yeah, just wanted to note that. <clears throat> Thank you. So you actually didn't interrupt me at all because you are in line with what I'm saying and with what David was saying about learning from history. I mentioned before to the deputy that my mother went to the seminary of teachers in Lvov. Uh, uh, and my parents fell in love in Kiev. So for me, these names and places are such an integral part of of how I grew up and the stories I grew up on and my attachment to places around the world. Um, right, and, and what you're saying, Ethan, is true always. It's always true. We, fa we always look back and say we failed. If we only could have done, if we only would have done, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And this is where the pain. This is where multi generational legacies of trauma happens, and the wounds remain. Remain. What do I mean by multi generational legacies of trauma or learning from history? What What we are actually saying in our work is that it, the history is not just a series of dates and events. We actually live history. History is in us. And it hurts us when, when we don't emerge from it and transform it. Uh, so, so this is part of the mission of, of the center. I do want also to, to let people know, I would be wrong not to, that we have created um, the, the way to assess scientifically multi-generational legacies of trauma. So those of you around the world who are interested, we have it in many languages, um, including in Ukraine, in, in, in Ukraine, uh, uh, Victor, we, will, we already have it in Kenya, Rwanda, but we're working to finalize the Swahili version. 
Uh, we have it in Russian. We have uh, on and on and on. Uh, I believe, and I, we even have it in Albanian because we studied Kosovo. So, um, so we even have the sciences to help us now to make better cases in the, in the International Criminal Court. And Klaus, what, what touched me most deeply in your comments, and I mean, all of them did, as usual. But it really, the ICC is a normative ideal of what justice is. And, and you're right that it can take the contribution or should take the contribution of any special tribunals. Of course, how else? This is how international law develops, right? So, so this is another piece of what gives me some hope. But uh, I hope Putin would not be horrible enough to, to, to activate anything nuclear. It, uh, it will change our world in ways that we, that we dread to even imagine. So I want, to, I'm sorry, I was talking about hope and then I'm also expressing despair, but I guess this is what's happening. Um, so please be with us and um, stay with us for future events too. Uh, this, is, this is existential. We are not just discussing some conceptual, uh, you know, fine points. This is about human life or death, and let's let's stay with life. So, thank you, thank you, Yael. Thank you again to everyone. And I think we have a lot of work to do. I think if certain things happen, it's because some people are getting nervous and nervous and nervous, and maybe also negative. So, the other side of the story is that probably our Ukrainian. Uh, colleagues and friends are, are doing an excellent job. So that's maybe why the other side is out of, completely out of uh, order. But let's stay united for the cause of the, the rule of law, justice, peace, and self-defense, because the right to peace include the right to self-defense, which is now exercised by the government and the people of Ukraine. And uh, I really look forward to, together with you, uh, Dan uh, Yael, and all the others to, to continue this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.